And so since uh, probably a large part of our audience isn't familiar with, with, uh, with what you do, um, since it's such a specific kind of thing, could you maybe just introduce yourself and describe your, your role and, and, and what, your, what your job is? Yeah, my name is Kenrick McDowell. I co-lead the Artists and Machine Intelligence Program at Google AI, where we bring artists and philosophers in to work with AI researchers uh, to produce art projects, to produce theory, to produce strategy. And um, I also do a lot of strategic work for Google AI. Um, I am a public speaker. I teach um, about AI-related fields. Uh, recently, uh, SciArc in Southern California teaching about AI urbanism. Um, but I also have done a lot of public speaking around um, what we can learn from wisdom traditions um, in technology making and how we can understand the process of technology making in a larger frame. One of the things I know you've been doing is um, developing a grant program for artists who work with machine learning. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how your program is sort of designed or uh, how it works around the support of, for artists and how that collaboration works with Google, like what, what, are, the, what are the structures there? Yeah, so um, our team, Artists and Machine Intelligence, uh, there's a couple program leads and then there are a few creative technologists uh, working between Google AI and Google Arts and Culture. And we provide funding, um, creative technologist support and program support for artists that have some interest in uh, technology, specifically machine learning. So we've got a cohort of six artists that we've been working with for six months about. Some of them work with sound, some of them are installation and new media artists, uh, some work with film, with text. And um, our goal really is to support emerging practices with ML, and I say emerging with ML, maybe not emerging artists themselves, they may be established, but that are starting to work with ML and really help them get on board and make it a critical part of their practice. I know you've been thinking a lot about the Anthropocene and climate change, ecology. Uh, it's interesting to think that there, that this tiny little thing that's not even a, a that's really microscopic and that doesn't necessarily uh, could be considered as uh, having any intention is essentially completely changing our society and bringing humanity almost to its knees. Um, for me, that's been an interesting topic of reflection around our able, ability to control our environments um, and, and sort of like a humility lesson almost. Absolutely. Uh, about about this idea that we are the rulers of <laughs> of the planet. Um, do you have any any thoughts on that? Um, well, it's it is funny because we've spent a lot of our team spent a lot of the last year um, talking about non-human intelligence and collaboration with non-humans and sort of um, put, making space for non-humans in our models. So you know, one of the things that we've been working on is a. Uh, a theory of expanded human-centered design. So taking the human-centered design ethos and saying, okay, well, given that we know humans are part of networks um, and we know that those networks involve non-humans, how can we imagine design uh, functioning with the non-human as, as an actor that's considered? And we were really challenged by some of the economic models that we're working from, just the idea that everything has to ultimately feed a bottom line and how do you introduce actors that can't participate in that necessarily directly, right? And if you do, you know, are you instrumentalizing? Anyway, questions like this came up, but we had always kind of treated it as, subconsciously, I think we were kind of saying like, hey, this is our moral responsibility. We're gonna do a favor to the biosphere by considering them as part of our economic model, you know? <laughs> and now it's like, no, that's not actually what's happening. <laughs> like this, like, as you say, this like tiny non-human intelligence, whatever intelligence it does have, has forced us to reconsider our economic model entirely. And uh, it's, not, it's not about us magnanimously like opening capitalism to animals. It's like, it's the, it, it is the fatal flaw of our system is that we haven't perceived non-humans. I have a question for you that kind of stems from one of the first conversations you and I had uh, on the phone 
I don't know, two years ago or something. And we were talking about um, new media festivals and you had brought up a conversation you had had with a, with a big, uh, let's say contemporary art curator. Uh, I think you were at Ars Electronica and he had, he had mentioned to you that oftentimes there's a problem with new media art is that it's so poorly presented. And that comment stuck with me um, uh, in large part because of the sort of the ease of, of new media art to be perceived as like a sort of a lower form of art, uh, meaning that it becomes more decor decorative or with concepts that are not really developed. Um, do you feel like there, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? And, and what do you think artists can do to elevate their, their presentation? Yeah, I mean, I think at the time that that happened, which was really only a few years ago, um, we were in a moment where media, new media was, in the contemporary, so-called contemporary art world and so-called new media art world were converging in a way. Um, and since then, I think there's, there has been much more interest from the gallery side, from the museum side. Um, but the interest is kind of keying into the same tendencies that weaken the presentation of that work whether or not it's a gata gallery or a museum, meaning people are looking for novelty or maybe people are looking um, specifically at like uh, a technical element of the work rather than the poetry of the work or the, or the sort of way that it sits within the larger continuum of art making. And I think um, it's easy when you're really close to technology to sort of see it against its most recent development or to sort of be looking for, I mean, we're always, especially the media artists, tech artists are always looking for ways of advancing their technical practice, just like any artist is. But because that technical practice is situated within um, a metabolism of technology development that is at scale, that goes very quickly, um, that the outputs can seem dated very quickly, or the way that it's presented can be sort of within this narrow temporal window. And, you know, the funny thing is you look back at like demo scene stuff from the 80s and 90s, or you look at like um, plotter art from the 50s, and it has this aura that feels really rich compared to something that might be way more technically complex that came out like two years ago that suddenly feels maybe camp or dated or... And, I think we have a tendency as people working in the space to perceive our work within a very short window. But if we open up what that window is, we may be able to allow more poetry, allow more context into the work and to see something that maybe isn't like the highest quality rendering or the, the most up-to-date thing. Like if it has a relevant poetic meaning, if it has something to say it can be enough and some i think we we sometimes index too much on like what's the new thing and that sets us up for failure in the future when it, you look back a few years later and go oh god cringe that was like so that moment you know and but that's another part of it too is like accepting that change in in uh technologies and in aesthetics and allowing it to be like of its moment and sometimes in order to do that you need to put more around it in terms of the conceptual apparatus or historical context and understanding. When I was in grad school, I interviewed Rachel Harrison, the sculptor, and she was talking about putting um, like a can of like Coke or something on top of a sculpture. And she was you know, combined with a couple of other elements, like, and she was saying she was really interested in how the constellation of these three things would change their meaning over time. And that like the Coke can has one meaning now, but like in 10 years, it means something else. And so do the other two and the way that they move in time is really interesting to her. And that seems to be something that we have a natural uh, position with as media artists is like, we're, it's always changing. And so that that's like, to see that as a strength and you know, what would you need to bring out that strength? Um, seems like a cool opportunity that we have, you know, to not be worried about like being obsolete. Do you have any advice given the situation that we have today and given your, you know, your particular position in the field. Do you have any advice for artists who are, I, I'm mostly interested in advice for artists who are starting in their career and who are potentially unsure about moving forward now, uh, considering the situation, but also advice that could be for people who are just thrown off, you know, and, and we don't really know um, what their next steps should be. One of the most important skills we can develop in the 21st century is understanding when we're being manipulated. Because we're so networked and so connected to each other and to the systems that we're using, it's 
sometimes really hard to figure out where our thoughts are coming from and where our desires are coming from. So, you know, the thing that you think you need to do might be something that's coded into the interface that you're using to do the work, right? Um, it may be in the tool or it may be in the platform that you're sharing it with. Like you may be incentivized in directions that go against your own nature. So I think if somebody's trying to understand like how to go about being an artist in the context that we're in, um, one of the best things you can do is develop a strong intuition and a strong sense of your own desires versus the desires that are sort of floating all around you. And that we're in a good time to go in and kind of experience that, but we're also in a time where we're spending a lot of time with interfaces and with platforms. And, you know, a lot of people are predicting that this relationship with platforms will become really normalized. So um, I guess my advice would be cultivate an inner knowledge of what you want to do as an artist. And when you engage with the tools and the platforms, be aware of the effect that they have on you.